خليل جحشان من المركز العربي في واشنطن يحييكم وسنعود الان خليل جحشان ويلكم تو يو تو ذا سكند سيشن اوف ذا سيمينار ذا يو اس بوليسي تووردز ذا ميدل ايست اندر ذا بايدن ادمنستريشن كونتينيوتي اند تشينج after the uh, six uh, the end of the sixth uh, week uh, after the inauguration uh, uh, on the 20th of january 2021 the uh, u.s foreign policy started to become clearer vis-a-vis -vis key issues uh, that uh, are important uh, to the new president and uh, are considered uh, priority questions uh, for this new administration. And we can summarize uh, these general traits uh, of the foreign policy of Mr. Biden uh, by focusing on four main themes that were uh, uh, detailed by uh, the uh, analysts uh, close to the Trump campaign throughout the last year. First of all, uh, the uh, Biden, uh, what Biden said uh, repeatedly, uh, whether uh, uh, on uh, uh, one occasion or uh, several occasions, America is back. And he means that the political process of the United States uh, has returned to its normal place. The traditional values and alliances and historical alliances uh, went back to uh, contributing to decision making, making. And after four years uh, of marginalization, marginalization by uh, Mr. Trump. Two, uh, Mr. Biden is uh, totally committed to reverse uh, the uh, uh, achievements of the previous administration and removing the damage of uh, the old administration before moving on to uh, carrying out uh, his program. Three, Mr. Biden and his advisors uh, consider it important to revive U.S. diplomacy and its institutions and its uh, uh, historical commitment uh, towards uh, issues that are at the heart of the U.S. interests in the region, particularly when it comes to human rights issues and encouraging democratic practices internally and internationally as well. And this commitment will be important very important especially if the new administration is uh, serious when it comes to most of the uh, dossiers that we discussed uh, during session one and uh, we will discuss during session two and also the unanimous uh, position by the uh, people in the close circles of uh, Mr. Biden M Mr. B uh, on the fact that Mr. Biden will focus on the Far East uh, and move away from Middle East issues, particularly when it comes to U.S.-China relations uh, for Mr. Biden, they are more important, more valuable uh, to the United States than, Amer than the Middle East and the endless conflict. So many analysts ask the question, could the United States return to what the situation was before the uh, destructive uh, 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 storm, uh, the Trump uh, tornado in 2016, and uh, what, uh, or 2018, and uh, what uh, are the effects of uh, these uh, uh, approaches on the US foreign policy when it comes to the Middle East? And we focused on these points during the first session and we will also highlight these things during the second session we have three participants from the united states of america who will participate and i will be introducing them before they begin their intervention i start with uh, dr daniel broomberg 
Dr. Uh, Daniel Bromberg is a senior non-resident fellow at the Arab Center, Washington. He's a personal friend and also a friend of the center. He's professor of political science, uh, director of democracy and governance studies at Georgetown University. He is also a senior non-resident fellow at the project on Middle East democracy in the United States and Washington. So uh, Dr. Uh, Bloomberg will talk for 15 minutes on the Biden administration and the Iranian challenge. What is the art of the possible uh, uh, during 15 minutes? And then we will move to another speaker. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Khalil, for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. And I will be speaking, uh, as is clear now, in English in the name of maintaining good relations between the Arab world and the United States, I think I'll make my contribution by being as clear as I can about a very difficult subject. And um, let me just say that in 15 minutes, it's really hard to sort of uh, provide a, a, a comprehensive overview of or, or frame for this question of where Biden's policies vis-a-vis -vis Iran will go. It's already started as a rather bumpy uh, beginning, hardly unusual for a new administration, which is just getting its, uh, its, its house in order, as it were. Um, but I want to start off my remarks, and I've got four or five principal points. I want to start off my remarks by uh, talking about first Iran, even though this is about sort of US policy, because I think it's important to recognize as just a point of departure, that um, the nature of the Islamic State itself creates a kind of exceptional context for U.S.-Iranian relations. And of course, the Islamic State is a new state. It was born in 1978-79 in the crucible of a revolution that was as much about building a new uh, state as it was about rejecting relations with the United States. The, the importance of sort of demonstrating that it is in the DNA of the Islamic Republic to uh, contend with and to spurn American influence, at least on a political, if not a cultural level, really creates a context which makes it very difficult for Iranian leaders who wish to normalize or have a more normal relationship with the United States to do so. And I don't think we should at all minimize the challenge before any Iranian leader at arriving at a, any kind of deal on the nuclear issue or any other issue with the United States, because there's such a deep sense that the very identity of the Islamic Republic is wrapped up in part in standing up to uh, the United States. And that is, of course, there are huge impediments on the domestic side in the US to any normalization or to any engagement with Iran, but they really pale in comparison, I would say, to the very deep sort of hostility that particularly within hardline uh, uh, arenas of the Islamic State exists to any kind of engagement. There isn't really a parallel in terms of, because our own identity in the United States is not wrapped up with opposing Iran. So I wanna make sure that we understand that although these clashes are historically linked, uh, there is very much a deeper sort of impediment, I would say, coming from, from the nature of the Islamic Republic, which has no parallel, and then obviously in the nature of the United States as well. That's, that's just point number one. Point number two, and that is this, despite this sort of deep embedded uh, ideological aspect to the Islamic Republic, Iran's leaders within the state apparatus and even the founding fathers of the Islamic Republic never agreed on the and the makeup or the ultimate sort of ideological perspective of Iran. There were deep fissures within the ruling elite, which sprang out in the late 90s uh, under the former president Khatami, but continued for the next two decades. Um, and to simplify matters, and I wanna make it clear that this is a grave simplification of a complex reality. One can say there are two camps. One. I would call the developmentalist camp. And for the development, developmentalist camp, Iran's future is based on oil sales and gas sales and enhancing its economy through rents derived from oil sales. And in order to have that kind of strategy, it's absolutely critical to engage with the West, to trade with the West, 
and have economic, if not political relations that strengthen the Islamic State through a developmentalist uh, project that is based on oil and gas sales. And so from the political economy to the political economy is this interest in having some form of normal relations. So that's the developmentalist camp. Then there is the resistance camp. And the resistance camp has a very different agenda. The resistance camp wants to disengage from the West, thinks it can find ways to sell and export oil and gas that will allow it to look eastward as, as opposed to westward. And this camp tends to be decidedly much more authoritarian. And if you would like, much, uh, much less open to notions of political pluralism and democracy by comparison to many within the developmentalist camp who believe not only in dialogue with the West, but dialogue within Iran itself. So you have these two political camps and every struggle over foreign policy in Iran is a struggle over domestic policy. I really think that's important to keep in mind, again, in a ways that make this quite exceptional and put real constraints both on uh, President Rouhani and Zarif in any effort to sort of re-engage with the United States. Um, the JCPOA, uh, the, the oil, uh, the nuclear agreement that is, was an agreement that was essentially engineered uh, by the developmentalist camp with the tentative blessing of Supreme Leader Khamenei, I say tentative or conditional. Um, it was a vote against nuclear weapons, against the idea of trying to advance a nuclear weapons program and in favor of the more kind of conventional oil-based oil -based development that, the, that, that was favored by the more pragmatic camp. And obviously that camp lost heavily <laughs> when our, uh, our own former Supreme Leader, who happily was not too Supreme, that is uh, uh, President Trump, uh, decided to walk away from the agreement, spurn an international commitment, which was not, by the way, a treaty. It was framed not as a treaty, but nevertheless, it was a commitment and an agreement, a deal. He walked away from it. And that really created a spiraling effect that undermined the power and authority of the developmentalists, the pragmatists, in favor of the hardliners. There's no question about that. And really convinced, I think, if anybody needed convincing in Iran, that Supreme Leader Khamenei's argument that Iran would never stick by, uh, the United States, sorry, that the U.S. would never stick by the deal was, was right, was correct, was proven by Trump's decision to walk away from the JCPOA. Um, and so that really the rug, I'm sorry to use that metaphor, but the rug was pulled out from under the entire agreement by this decision and really led to a process of, of, giving, of opening the door for the hardliners and their effort to push Iran towards this resistance position away from engagement with uh, the West and away from the kind of economic relations that are dependent on that kind of engagement, if not with the United States and certainly Western European countries as well as Russia and China. Um, so the uh, resistant camp became ascendant. Um, and this is the situation that the, uh, the new administration here in Washington has inherited. And the new administration would like to uh, move towards uh, reestablishing the JCPOA uh, as it is framed and as it exists currently. But at the same time, the Biden administration has uh, declared, and Biden was very clear about this in the presidential campaign, that it wants to move beyond the JCPOA to engage wider issues that were excluded from the JCPOA, in particular, the question of ballistic missiles, and the wider question of Iran's uh, uh, actions and behavior and those of its uh, regional allies, Hezbollah, for example, uh, in, in the Middle East. And so this was a true two-prong approach uh, that the Biden administration adopted. Uh, and uh, it's based on the pr proposition that you get first a return to JCPOA, and then you engage on wider issues. Now, what are the constraints to both countries moving in this direction. I think we have seen them clearly. I've already mentioned some of the deeper, if you like, structural constraints, but I think we have to recognize that both in Washington and in Tehran, uh, there is ample domestic opposition uh, to uh, any kind of uh, re return to the JCPOA. Each city, if you like, each capital has its own uh, hardliners. 
Um, and there is no doubt that Biden's approach is very much uh, geared on the assumption that he has to mold his policy in part by not demonstrating that he's giving away too many assets at once. So, so there is tremendous pressure on the United States and on Biden not to make the first move and to demand that Iran comes back to compliance first, and then we will remove the sanctions. And in parallel, we have the Iranian position, which is the United States has to move first, remove all the sanctions, and then we can talk. We are at a stalemate here in terms of this uh, face-off, a, a stalemate that really echoes all these constraints and histories in U.S.-Iranian relations I've been talking about. Uh, my guess, and I'm going to finish up here, I think my guess is that we're going to find that the two sides are going to find a, a, some way behind the scenes to sort of come up with an agreement that looks like some sort of simultaneous process of removing sanctions and renegotiating. Because ultimately, the alternative to not reaching an agreement is probably going to be some slip into some sort of armed conflict. I think both sides understand this. Perhaps I'm being too optimistic, but my guess would be that even with the recent bumps we've seen in the last few days, they will find a way to do so because it's in the interest of both the United States and Iran uh, to find, uh, to reestablish this agreement at the very least. Whether they can do something beyond that remains to be seen. So this is going to be a difficult, arduous process. Iran has presidential elections coming up in June. Everyone there is looking at that. This is partly what the battle in Iran is now, now about, those elections refracted into the arena of international politics. Thank you very much. Shukran, Daniel, ala hadhi al-mudakhala bi khusus al-tahadhi. Thank you, Daniel, for this intervention regarding the challenge that Washington is facing when it comes to dealing with Iran. We now move to the second uh, speaker, Mrs. Sama Al Hamdani, founder and executive director of the Yemen Cultural Institute for Heritage and Arts, YCIHA, previously a non resident fellow at the Middle East Institute and visiting fellow at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. Her many political analyses have been widely published in Arab and Western research institutes and media outlets, particularly when it comes to Yemen. Mrs. Al Hamdani is going to talk to us about Biden's Yemen policy and the limits of change. The floor is yours. Um, Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank you for this introduction, and I would like to apologize uh, because my Arabic uh, uh, could be considered weak compared to the other panelists. Uh, I would like to start by uh, a simple comparison. Uh, President Biden uh, focused just like uh, Mr. Trump on y Yemen, but uh, uh, on Yemen, but uh, uh, Mr. Trump decided uh, to uh, support a uh, failing uh, operation. Uh, President Biden is trying to reduce the uh, humanitarian suffering in Yemen, the direct result of war. And Biden foreign policy focuses on putting an end to the war and Biden and other uh, Biden um, uh, administration staff talked about the importance of putting an end to the war in Yemen. As I have said, the new measures taken by the new U.S. administration highlights the humanitarian suffering. And despite the focus by the media on uh, uh, lifting Ansarullah, uh, the Houthis, from uh, the uh, terrorism designation, which led to uh, contradicting analysis, but this is in favor of protecting the Yemeni people and further deterioration at the humanitarian level. And also there was a temporary freezing of arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. These decisions were based on uh, analyses and uh, came as a direct uh, uh, reaction to 
the uh, humanitarian lobbying in Washington for years, since the beginning of the war. In addition to that, during this week, the uh, U.S. Congress continued the discussions uh, to uh, pressure uh, Biden administration to continue the freezing of arms uh, sales, but also not only offensive, but defensive as well to UAE and KSA. So the Senate uh, and the Congress in general is still uh, really concerned uh, uh, when it comes to uh, Yemen. And at the humanitarian level, the uh, Biden administration lifted uh, the Muslim ban and uh, uh, that used to complicate the lives of uh, Yemeni people in the United States. That would allow the uh, Yemeni people to travel to the United States and extend the TBS uh, for uh, the uh, Yemeni citizens in the United States. This is part of the local domestic Biden administration policy that wants to be more understanding vis-a-vis -vis immigrants to the United States. Of course, the Biden administration is moving uh, uh, very quickly in order to amend and modify and change the political mistakes and to re-establish the old role of the United States and the region by focusing mainly on human rights and trying to establish a balance in the region that would allow the United States to be a player, effective player in the Arab Gulf, in addition to Saudi Arabia and Iran in particular. And returning to diplomacy, this uh, return to diplomacy, which was uh, uh, highlighted uh, uh, in the first session. This return to diplomacy does not mean that the United States will prefer Ansarullah or any relationship in the future with Iran. It would not prefer it uh, uh, more than the relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia. The uh, Secretary of State uh, repeatedly condemned Ansarullah's attacks targeting Saudi Arabia. And this is a proof the United States is committed towards peace in Yemen, and it will not be permanent. Should the uh, Yemeni party not react positively, and international parties not react positively with the new role played by the United States of America, there will be no surprise if we see a continuation of uh, the Yemen conflict, and it could become even worse from a humanitarian perspective. Despite that, the time for or putting an end to the Yemen war in the region is important uh, and for the interest of uh, the Saudi Emirati alliance. Uh, the, uh, the leaving of the Yemen uh, has become more complicated. The Trump administration dealt with this dossier as an extension of the Saudi dossier. Now, Mr. Blinken is uh, uh, working on this uh, dossier and he will participate uh, in the donors uh, uh, conference uh, uh, that will be held on the 1st of March. In addition to the focus on the humanitarian needs and diplomatic needs, the Yemen dossier now is subject to the uh, administration of the U.S. president directly and the White House directly. And this is a big development and change. And this brings me to the appointment of Mr. Tim Lenderking, special envoy to Yemen. He is a professional dip diplomat, worked under Trump administration as uh, the person in charge of these policies in uh, the region. And he was the uh, also in, in Riyadh uh, with the US delegation. And this comes to reassure uh, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Yemen focuses on putting an end to the conflict. Uh, but this does not undermine the uh, uh, relation between U.S. and KSA. Uh, this is a very difficult task, uh, and uh, announcing a ceasefire in Yemen does not pragmatically mean putting an end to the war, because the United States would need a major support from the EU and the UN and the UK. Until now, the UK, the UK did not uh, express uh, any uh, political and peaceful statement vis-a-vis -vis Yemen. Uh, yes, needs a gradual process that works on convincing the local parties to the conflict in Yemen. This, in addition, this is in addition to convincing regional actors. In addition to that, in order to reach. Uh, serious uh, uh, peaceful process, the United States would need to resort to a third party, a neutral third party, 
only Oman can play this role in order to encourage real possibility for peace. At the end, uh, the United States thinks that the uh, end of the Yemen war is the key to improve the Iranian-U.S. relations because the solution to the Yemen war is easier than the war in Iraq and Syria, where Iran has a stronger uh, role in the conflict. When it comes to the U.S. policies uh, to fight terrorism, it will, or the Biden administration will continue, just like other democratic administrations, to face the uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and ISIS in Yemen. And uh, the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia are two key allies in fight against uh, terrorism. Uh, that was uh, an, uh, a summary of my analysis of uh, Mr. Biden's uh, policy vis-a-vis Yemen. I would like to thank you so much. And uh, I w- would be talking uh, a mixture of English and Arabic uh, when I answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sama. And now we move to the third topic during this second session, which is the trends in U.S.-Saudi relations uh, under the Biden administration. So, of course, there are several uh, developments uh, and events that are taking place uh, until uh, the latest uh, hours. A debate uh, is ongoing when it comes to this relation as a result of the developments uh, that we uh, saw in Washington yesterday. So, uh, Dr. Imad Harb is the next panelist, uh, our uh, colleague at the Arab Center in Washington. He's the Director of Research and Analysis at the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. He is the founder and the Director of... Uh, Quest for Middle East Analysis and previously adjunct professor of Middle East Studies at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. His published work focuses on civil military relations, regional politics, and U.S. policy in the Middle East, North Africa, and the Arab Gulf. Dr. Ahmad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Khalil, for this introduction. And uh, I would like uh, to thank you and to thank the participants and the panelists for being here. Talking about the U.S. Uh, Saudi relations uh, uh, is complicated, is uh, thorny, as everybody knows. And I wanted to put it in several contexts, so to speak. Uh, These contexts would allow us to elaborate uh, how could the Biden administration deal uh, with Saudi Arabia in the coming period. I think there are three general frameworks that could be considered when it comes to this relation. Uh, and and uh, what it could uh, be in the future. The first one is what does Saudi Arabia represent when it comes to U.S. foreign policy? So what is the position of Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, foreign policy uh, of the United States and how is it perceived by Washington? Today, we are talking about a different uh, situation and uh, it could be drastically uh, uh, different than the situation in the past. The Saudi-American relations started uh, more than seven decades ago, and it's still ongoing, but we noticed that recently, at least uh, since 10 years, there has been a a lot of uh, lack of communication when it comes to the will of the U.S. administrations uh, and what 
do these administrations want from Saudi Arabia and the Middle East? In reality, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, when it comes to U.S. policy, represents several uh, things. First of all, uh, the theme or the topic of uh, oil and how is uh, Saudi Arabia perceived by Washington at this level. In reality, the United States does not need to perceive Saudi Arabia as the uh, mega exporter of uh, oil to the United States because uh, the United States is uh, almost independent uh, uh, when it comes to uh, oil coming from the Middle East and Saudi Arabia in particular. In 2019, the United States produced approximately 20 million uh, barrel of oil on a daily basis. It was the uh, first uh, producer of oil in the world in 2020 and in 2021 the average will be 11 million barrels a day and this is still the biggest uh, figure uh, when it comes to uh, production of oil all over the world this is why the Saudi oil is not key uh, when it comes to U.S. foreign policy or the uh, reliance uh, on Saudi Arabia to export oil. The U.S. is importing uh, around 9 or 10 percent from its oil or of its oil from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, it is constantly ready to change that uh, the main imports come from Canada and from Mexico and of course from its local production. So the second point is the role of Saudi Arabia in the war against terrorism. This is a detailed uh, dossier that started at least two decades ago and the kingdom can take this stance or take this position as an important uh, position uh, when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, and Washington will continue to focus on this topic and what could Saudi Arabia offer at this level, especially that the kingdom is the neighbor of one of the most dangerous uh, international terror organization, Al-Qaeda, in the Arabian Peninsula. So, from another uh, point of view, the U.S., uh, presence in the Middle East. Uh, it is mainly based on a situation in the in the Middle East uh, or the Arabian Gulf. And uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is this big uh, framework for the strategic uh, relation. And also the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is one of the elements to face Iran. Regardless of this new approach by the new administration when it comes to dealing with Iran, however, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has an important role to play at this level. And at the same time, the other topic, which is also very important, is that Saudi Arabia is a big market for arms and weapons coming from the United States throughout the five years saudi arabia signed uh, contracts valued at uh, 46 billion dollars and uh, the weapons coming from the united states uh, uh, can or have a share up to 75 percent uh in saudi arabia which means that uh, the uh, market of uh, weapons U.S. weapons in Saudi Arabia is very important. I would also like to th like to say that throughout the last five years, uh, the Trump administration focused on a good relation with Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE. This focus by the Trump administration affected, uh, to a large extent, the uh, foreign policy of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, which means regardless of what President Biden uh, does uh, to change the U.S. policy towards KSA, uh, the biggest hurdle would be this open policy, uh, foreign policy of the United States towards Saudi Arabia during the Trump administration. And just like uh, uh, Daniel uh, Bromberg said, Biden has to deal with Iran also 
taking into account the heritage of Trump. And also the same applies to Saudi Arabia. The second theme when it comes to the perception to the region and to Saudi Arabia, so the will, if there is a sustainable and continuous American will to keep its stance in the Middle East just like it was before, so moving towards Asia, particularly the threat coming from China, this is a huge topic and successive U.S. administrations wanted uh, at least uh, since 10 years or 14 years there was a new approach by the Biden and Trump administration to withdraw a little bit from the Middle East and the problems of the Middle East. Trump and Barack Obama, both of them said they wanted to withdraw from uh, the endless wars in the Middle East and this is something very important especially that the moving towards Asia does not mean a total withdrawal from the Middle East but at the same time it means that the United States can deal with the threat coming from China at its early stages and this is why it doesn't have to deal with it in the Middle East. So uh, the United States is to move a little bit towards the Far East uh, and to face the challenge coming from China. This started with the Obama defensive strategy since 2012. And although Biden talked about a close relation with the Middle East, I think that uh, he will continue to adopt this approach. There's also what happened uh, during the last decade and uh, the normalization uh, between Gulf countries and Israel. This lifted uh, some of the responsibility felt by the United States uh, when it comes to the security of the region. For instance, if Israel is the normalizing country with Gulf countries, and if Gulf countries are uh, consenting or accept to deal with uh, Israel at the political and economic and security levels, the, so the United States does not really have to be involved when it comes to defending the security of the Gulf and this American will to reduce its military presence in the Middle East comes in this context. There's also an important uh, topic, which is the change at the level of the American society, at the political level and at the level of the society. We do not say that the U.S. foreign policy, of course, just like Dan said, the U.S. foreign policy is the result of an internal uh, domestic policy. What do internal parties want? And the conflict uh, uh, when it comes to foreign policy reflects the domestic policies and vice versa. Uh, the society in the United States changed a little bit, at least uh, compared to what it used to be during the Obama administration, particularly at the level of the Democratic Party. There was a change when it comes to the perception towards the Middle East, not only towards Saudi Arabia, of course, but also towards other dossiers. For instance, Iraq, Syria, Palestine. And it is true that this new current, this new movement is still weak and it's still small compared to other more traditional uh, movements at the level of the Democratic Party and all over the U.S. society. They have influence, particularly the youth, and this will highly affect the perception of the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis Saudi Arabia and uh, regimes like the Saudi regimes in the Middle East. There is a new approach, indeed. And 
the U.S. administration defends, of course, the strategy and the strategic interests of the United States. But at the same time, at the level of the U.S. society, at the level of the American society, there could be internal uh, positions, uh, domestic positions uh, that would affect uh, the uh, perception and uh, the United States uh, could be defending human rights uh, and this is always highlighted in speeches verbally without uh, showing any practical tangible commitments. In my opinion what's happening at the level of the US society is uh, a tendency to pressure the leadership, the political leadership in the United States and pressure the parties and interests in order to talk about uh, the humanitarian situation and democracy in the Middle East. And I would like to uh, talk about uh, uh, what Sama uh, al-Hamdani mentioned, uh, the high interest in Yemen. Yes, this is true. Uh, the people of the United States, and especially at the level of the Congress, people are interested when it comes to the decision to deal with Yemen and how um, and how could the United States deal with the Yemen dossier also we can talk about the uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, issue we can talk about it later it is an important uh, issue when it comes to the US Congress and the press and the public opinion this is why there are domestic changes at the level of the U.S. society that could affect the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia. These are uh, different themes that could affect President Biden's approach towards Saudi Arabia. And now, we get to the current issue, which is the assassination of uh, Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey. And what uh, we knew yesterday uh, through the CIA intelligence uh, report uh, about the involvement of uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And in my opinion, this will bring together several themes that I tackle and the things that could happen in the future. So uh, the fact that the administration released this report, but at the same time, the administration refrained from uh, holding uh, the uh, perpetrators accountable. So we are saying that Mohammed bin Salman is responsible for the assassination, but we will not take any steps uh, towards uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So this will affect the position of the Congress, the press, the public opinion vis-a-vis -vis this administration. And there will be a lot of lobbying. There will be a lot of pressure imposed on this administration. The administration would have to answer several questions as to how to allow this individual uh, basically to be in a state of impunity. And uh, how can we say that uh, punishment uh, as to be or limited uh, level of al Asiri and other uh, people who executed the task at hand without talking about Mohammed bin Salman. And I wanted to say something uh, as to how could this administration deal with someone like Mohammed bin Salman should he uh, become the king of Saudi Arabia after this political catastrophe in reality. This individual Even if the U.S. administration does not take any measures uh, towards him, this individual, Mohammed bin Salman, will be in a state of crisis, a huge crisis at the ethical, moral, 
and values level. How could a person uh, responsible for the assassination of a Saudi citizen who talked about human rights, freedom, and democracy, how could this person rule a country and deal with uh, the world and its counterparts uh, at ease? This will affect his relationship not only with his people, but also with the United States. From a political point of view, how could a person who we could say is uh, was, was uh, so to speak, wounded by this uh, report uh, that uh, talked about him as responsible for the assassination of a Saudi citizen. So how could he face the challenges within the ruling family uh, and the opposition that he faces at the level of the family? We know that several members of the ruling family objected uh, uh, the uh, fact that he is in this uh, position of leadership and they will continue to object, in my opinion, because the policies that he adopted were wrong and arbitrary and also the economic project that he talked about and he is actually carrying it out the economic project needs hundreds of billions of dollars of investments and most of them will be domestic but also foreign investments coming from abroad how can investors invest in uh, saudi projects while muhammad bin salman is accused of killing jamal khashoggi i will stop here and uh, i will be ready to answer your questions thank you thank you Imad. and now we move to the q and a session I would like by posing a question that we have faced in the first session and it's still valid so far as the, the presence of at least one trend within the Biden camp who want divorce from the Middle East. This divorce is described in different ways. <clears throat> Sometimes it's called pivoting, to, i.e., to shift the focus of U.S. policy from one area to another. And we also spoke about some people within the administration, and maybe Biden himself wants this divorce with the Middle East. But it seems that the, the Middle East doesn't want to be divorced from the United States. So I'd like to pose this question to our three uh, panelists, uh, Daniel, Sama, and Imad. Do you think the relationship between the United States uh, and the Arab world and the Middle East is a Catholic marriage that will no, no divorce? Danny? Michael. Yeah. I'm not good at it. So sorry. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. I would say that here's a here's here's a big picture answer. I, you know, I think there is, in some sense, uh, a certain degree of, of continuity in sort of American policies vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the region, and there has been, you know, since Obama, a, a general sort of. Um, shift in terms of wanting to dis find some way to sort of disengage. Um, and I think that Trump in his own way took this to its logical conclusion by basically um, uh, by basically indicating that the America first uh, position would be that we are not going to sort of make sacrifices for the region or engage in ways that really will in any way uh, undermine our, our domestic priorities at home. And so, Trump sort of took this perspective to its logical conclusion, which meant with withdrawing American presence from the region and the question of American troops in Iraq, obviously, in Syria was part of that. Um, now, I think 
Biden wants to have his cake and eat it too, uh, because he would like to find a way to um, re-engage. But it's not as clear, uh, it's not clear that he's ready to sort of take the kinds of actions that would uh, put the United States in a position of really uh, asserting the kind of leadership that would be necessary for that kind of level of engagement. And I think we can see this in the recent uh, U.S. response to the attack in Erbil, but near it, on, on a U.S. military base, Air Force base, in which it was a very precise attack meant to sort of demonstrate American will, determination to establish or sustain deterrence, but not enough to suggest that the United States was willing to sort of really, uh, in any way, significant way, uh, uh, up its sort of um, its military presence in the region or change the basic equation. So I think there's just, there's more continuity in the uh, situation than than we might we might otherwise uh, sometimes assume, and we're going to see uh, Biden managing these 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 opposing sort of uh, impulses as best as he can. شكرا دانيال سماء هل تنطبق هذه المقولة أيضا على شك أو موضوع اليمن في إطار السياسة الخارجية الأمريكية أم هو أقل خطرا على الموقف من اليمن خصوصا في هذا الوقت بالذات يعني لا يمكنني أن أصف العلاقة بين الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية واليمن كزواج يعني ربما مع المملكة العربية السعودية على وجه التحديد لكن في حال اليمن إذا نظرنا إلى عهد ترامب فكانت أمريكا مطلقة لليمن بشكل تام لهذا السبب ترى الآن بايدن يحاول جهده أن يستعيد العلاقة الأمريكية التي كانت موجودة في السابق بالرغم يعني من أن حكومة أوباما هي فعلا التي الإدارة التي بدأ بدأت حرب اليمن في وقتها ذكر المتحدث سابق في الجلسة التي كانت قبلنا أن المنطقة بشكل عام ستظل مهمة لأنها مهمة لأعداء الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وأعتقد أن المنطقة واليمن ودول أخرى مثل اليمن التي يعني ليست هي دول رئيسية في في نظر الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية قد تكون دول تتحارب فيها الدول الأخرى يعني كحروب الوكالة فيجب علينا أن نراقب المنطقة Uh, we, we must uh, watch the area, otherwise the war by proxy would continue. Thank you, Sama Imad. Yes, thank you. I agree with what Sama has said just now. In fact, the United States position vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East in many aspects is based on how the United States can uh, um, uh, not allow the others from entering into the area. The United States is a country with its presence throughout the world. It has a very striking power. It, has the, it is the dominant uh, a power which has hegemony. So therefore, nobody can replace the United States by being able to be to replace the United States in other places in the world. And in my estimation, this will not happen maybe in the last, in, 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 at least in the next 50 years. So the United States will be here in the Middle East if only for not allowing others to move into the area and because it is a present power everywhere else. We have a question from Marlin Misakopian about the Khashoggi affair. The question is to Dr. Bromberg. Outside and outside uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, do, we, do you believe, or will, will that be limited, uh, essentially? Limited to what? Uh, will it be both uh, impacting the status, uh, if you will, uh, inside or outside uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, will, will the report impact have well, international or just local? 
impact. No, I mean it's going to have a, both a local and international impact because of the report it, it suggests, of course, that uh, the United States is dealing with a, a leader or a, 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 a soon to be or probably to be leader of a country who was directly involved in, in, in a conspiracy act international order. So uh, it's going to definitely uh, uh, complicate uh, uh, the relationship with Saudi Arabia and the United States. Again, the U.S. administration is trying to have its cake and eat it too by issuing a report, by implicating uh, MBS in the murder, and at the same time, not taking the next step of literally banning uh, the Crown Prince from visiting the United States. Uh, it's an effort to sort of have it both ways. And I think it's not going to play very well because it's gonna send uh, multiple signals to multiple constituencies, certainly from the view of Iran, by the way, this is only good news <laughs> because the, uh, the uh, increasing tensions between Saudi Arabia uh, and the United States will certainly convince Iran that it's probably better off holding on to its current position. So it's definitely going to uh, cut in different ways. All right, thank you. Uh, a follow-up uh, regarding the uh, Khashoggi situation from the same person, uh, Madeline. Uh, she ba is basically saying, how come there are no references? Uh, I don't know if she means by us. I mean, we didn't go into the detail, but, uh, <laughs> or in general, uh, regarding uh, Khashoggi's connection to ISIS. Uh, which was played a role, if you will, or was related to his uh, persecution. Uh, would uh, Ahmad, would you like to take a jab at this? And I would like to contribute to that, having known Khashoggi for more than 30 years. I don't mind uh, uh, responding to that. Ahmad? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, um... Uh, I don't really have any information about this. I know him as a man who was trying to to expand the democratization process in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He was trying to uh create uh, changes resulting in the change of the policies of the saudi arabia um, directly um first of all I, i've known uh, khashoggi for more than uh, 35 years uh prior to his assassination and uh, uh in, in a previous uh, incarnation, I used to work very closely with uh, different countries in the region uh, to improve their U.S. relations with the United States, and that included Saudi Arabia. I frequented the kingdom at least two or three times, sometimes more uh, a year, uh, and met regularly with its leadership. I got to know Jamal because he was appointed by his own government, uh, if you will, as a resource person to meet with all foreign guests. So I, I didn't choose him per se. Uh, he was chosen uh, by the leadership uh, in Saudi Arabia because of his education in the U.S. Uh, and uh, his influence uh, within the system to try to always be included. So every visit he was, let's say, on, on the protocol, on, on the list of guests uh, to, to, to see those of us who came from the outside and considered uh, friendly uh, to, to, to the uh, kingdom uh, and, and to brief us on what is needed and to be, you know, to, to hear to basically our perspective uh, on what needs to be done in terms of the bilateral relationship. Uh, uh, definitely the issue has come up recently, as Madeline is saying, in terms of connection to ISIS. I don't think personally uh, that uh, Khashoggi, and I think I've, I've known him as well as anybody else uh, outside, I don't think he had a connection with ISIS other than the period when he was working for both uh, as a media. Uh, person and having basically conducted some interviews uh, with some Saudis uh, affiliated with these radical movements, including bin Laden himself, but was totally cleared and, and authorized uh, by the Saudi government. He was not necessarily uh, going improvising or going on his own uh, based on personal relationship with, uh, with these uh, people. Did he have uh, Islamist uh, tendencies. I would describe him as uh, uh, Islamist light. He did have uh, some sympathy uh, with uh, the rise, if you will, 
uh, of Islamist political thought, whether in the kingdom or, or beyond. And he talked about that uh, freely and, and wrote about it. Maybe that's what got him in trouble. But more than that, if you're interested into what really got him in trouble, I think you should go to our website at Arab Center Washington and uh, dig up, uh, if you could Google there, uh, Khashoggi and the interview uh, that he did for us, not interview, I'm sorry, the uh, lecture uh, that he gave uh, at uh, one of our events uh, before his, a year before almost his assassination in which he said his famous sentence that I believe ended up killing him. Uh, I think he said several things uh, of value in, in that interview uh, when, uh, uh, I introduced him uh, to our public at the time at the National Press Building uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but he said something interest, he's interesting, and he said that came up actually just yesterday again in the news. Uh, and he said it, uh, as I said, in our uh, Arab Center uh, event. Uh, he said, uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, with the reference uh, to uh, MBS, uh, he said, I have no problem with what he is doing. I have problem with the way he is going about it. And that was the beginning of the rupture, if you will, between a person who was viewed an, as an insider uh, to the royal family and to the government uh, of Saudi Arabia, uh, worked for his, its intelligence, worked for its diplomatic uh, uh, core, you know, in, in terms of the embassies, uh, whether in Washington or in, in London, then all of a sudden he becomes anathema or the enemy uh, of, of, of the state. But I doubt very much that he was affiliated with uh, ISIS. Uh, I have not seen from him, having had many, many, many conversations with him, uh, and many of those we disagreed about, uh, And uh, but I, I do not subscribe uh, to the allegation, which I believe is more of an attempt to defame him more than anything else and to justify uh, his assassination. It was more than persecution. Ahmad, did you want to add something to that or? Uh, no, I, I just wanted to point out that that event was uh, somewhere around uh, May or June 2017. Our, okay. our uh, I mean, I mean, our seminar with him. Yeah, it's, uh, it's on our website. I think it's dated. Uh, maybe we posted it a little bit later, around September, but uh, it, it is available on our uh, website. Um, Imad, there is a question for you. هل يمثل مشروع التطبيع الإسرائيلي مع الدول الخليج? The normalization between Israel and the Gulf countries, does it represent a bigger... Big, does it have big importance in the Biden's policy towards the Middle East? Thank you. This is a very relative question, although it's a very wide-ranging one. First of all, Joe Biden will not have any objections to any normalization between the Arabs and Israel. Secondly, Will, this, will Saudi Arabia normalize relations with Israel soon? I think this can be a factor. Uh, our, uh, one of the influences on how the United States will deal with Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia. Mohammed bin Salman has met with, uh, there were many press reports with Benjamin Netanyahu I think it was in Elat or some months ago. And also there are, we heard uh, uh, Israel 24 uh, has uh, had a, a report about that. There is talk of a security alliance between Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Israel. And also there is talk about some the Saudi Arabians may be normalizing relations with uh, Israel depending on how the how Mohammed bin Salman can deal or cannot deal with the United States and if the Gulf countries think that the Zionists will rush 
to save them from Iran, I think they'll be mistaken. We know in politics, everything is possible. And maybe this is what we will see in the near future. But I think the situation now is very fluid. There are not so many things that we can bank on, but I'm open to the development. Thank you, Imad. This question that you just answered was from Muhammad al-Hadithi. Thank you, Muhammad, for your question. There are a few questions regarding the relationship between the United States and uh, the Biden administration with its uh, allies in so much as dealing with these issues that we discussed are concerned. Muhammad Shuaib says that the United States and its policies always coordinates with regional countries, especially its traditional allies like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, and also with Turkey regarding certain issues like Iran. And sometimes there is coordination with Egypt and Iraq regarding other issues. So each issue or dossier, it seems that the United States links it with a certain ally. A question, this is a question to all three of you. Do you expect this kind of uh, coordination, Daniel, specifically regarding uh, negotiations to, re to return to the nuclear deal with Iran? Some people are asking the United States to play a role in any future negotiations soon. Is this a practical demand? Of course, Iran is refusing that, but from an American point of view, is such demand from America's Arab allies to take part in such negotiations makes them want a seat at the negotiation table. Is this applicable and rational? Uh, uh, Daniel, the question is yours. If I'm understanding the correct the question correctly, and I want to make sure I do, um, the question pertains to sort of whether the demand from Arab countries, Gulf countries in particular, to somehow be participants or linked to the negotiations is logical and uh, and uh, and and useful. Is that the gist of the question, Khalil? Yes. Yeah, good. I just want to make sure that I answering the question I think I'm hearing. You know, it's not, uh, it's certainly um, the challenge for the, the Biden administration is to consult with all its regional uh, friends at the same time, make sure that those who could uh, get in the way of negotiations with Iran are not able to do so. And reaching that sweet spot of engaging the concerns of Saudi Arabia, Israel, Bahrain, UAE, and so on. And at the same time, make it clear that the, the for now, the present negotiations must be focused on resuscitating and saving the JCPOA, which means that any effort to in any way formally involve other regional actors in this negotiation would torpedo it in a minute. Uh, and the United States understands that. So how do you sort of address these concerns uh, from other actors and players, allies, friends? <clears throat> it's a very difficult road to, to pursue, but the Iranians have made it clear that uh, the United States, it's a non-starter to suggest that somehow the US should involve these other countries. And it's not clear how this can be done without, uh, without uh, undermining the negotiations. So, you know, this is going to be a difficult path to, 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 to hold for the administration, but I think it will stick to its position and focus solely on the US-Iran nuclear file for now, beyond, before in any way expanding the talks to any other subject. Uh, Shukran, Daniel. Uh, uh, yani these Daniel, uh, Sama, this is a question to you. So far as Yemen is concerned, the question of other allies is easier because these other allies are party to the crisis in Yemen. 
Saudi Arabia plays a role, Qatar plays the role, the UAE plays the role. There is talk now, and as you said in your opening remarks, that uh, the American envoy to the Yemen, Linda King, has initiated talks with these countries. Will this continue and develop? I expect that to happen. The main problem is like when it's like what Dan has suggested that uh, America does not know Iran and does not know the Houthis and Sarullah, which is a close ideological uh, group. So they have to, or someone has to, convince the Houthis of the feasibility of peacemaking because you know there are battles going on in, Ma in Ma'rib. The United States usually uses many cards to apply pressure. Iran has to apply pressure on the Ansar Allah to stop the war in Yemen, but I wanted to talk about the American report on the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, I guess that the United States would use this report as a, a bargaining chip to make sure that Saudi Arabia will stop the war. And if you, going back to the metaphor you used about marriage, I think the United States would want uh, custody on the children of this marriage, which is the Yemen. And who, the question will be, who will pay the alimony and who will pay maintenance now? The area now is too busy dealing with COVID-19 and economically speaking, the area is shut down. And maybe the United States if in the first plan doesn't work, maybe use other cars to solve the problem. Imad? Uh, in fact, I don't see in the Middle East or the Arab world that uh, there is someone who can be relied on to to stand up in parallel to the United States, like Saudi Arabia was in the Lebanon or as it is in the Yemen. Lebanon has become a too complicated issue and the Yemen uh, after Saudi Arabia's intervention and also in Syria, when the United States has uh, uh, employed the Syrian regime uh, to act as an agent to sort out Lebanon's affairs. In my estimation, if the administration wants to contract out uh, or source out some of the issues in the Middle East to other countries, first they have to make sure that these countries are really able and they are up to the task. Syria, Libya, Lebanon, Yemen are all vivid examples which do not, which do not uh, really constitute uh, any reason for optimism. Uh, they cannot deal with their own problems, let alone contribute to solving the problems of others. Thank you, Imad. Sama, in your question, uh, in your reply, sorry, mentioned the Ansar Allah. There is a question about this from Sultan Yahya, who was asking, how will removing the Houthi's name from the terrorist uh, uh, designation list, uh, how will it solve the Yemen's uh, humanitarian situation when in fact they are the cause of it? Can you please explain to us the logic that the administration used to remove their name and uh, to remove the name of this terrorist organization's name from the list? There are uh, different ways 
to answer this question. First of all, the Ansar Allah, all of their monies and uh, bank accounts are in the Yemen. They don't use any banking system outside Yemen, so the designation would not harm them. Secondly, the sanctions are not on just the Ansar Allah, but on any party who tries to financially help anybody who lives in an area under the control of the Houthis. Unfortunately, there are some 24 million Yemenis under the authority of Ansar Allah on the ground. So not just uh, the citizens of Yemen, but the humanitarian organizations who try to provide any help to any area or anybody who lives in an area under Ansar Allah will be punished too. For this reason, the World Food Program, which is active in Yemen, if they continued to finance certain entities in Yemen to provide food for Yemenis, they will be designated an organization supporting terrorism, so they should stop all their help for Yemenis who are starving. So I think it is logical, ultimately, because when, when the Trump administration made this designation, did that in the last minute in attempt to appease the Saudis. So if, if the Trump administration did not do that, the Biden administration wouldn't have needed to do what they did and appear like uh, uh, favoring the Houthis. Thank you, Sama. A question from Rashid. This question will be to Daniel. Daniel, you wrote extensively in the past and you have a lot of research on the question of uh, democracy and democratization in the Arab world and in North Africa, Tunisia in particular. The question is, do you expect anything new so far as American foreign policy is concerned towards North Africa, especially what the union of the Maghreb countries and the Eisenstadt initiative, and also the, any international solution of the Western Sahara, do you have any My, comments? That's a, yeah, that, is a, that is a huge question. We should be I, out of here by next week. All right. <laughs> we'll be out of here by next week. But I mean, the Western Sahara crisis, of course, the, the decision, uh, the steps taken uh, by, uh, by the former administration of President Trump to sort of recognize Morocco's claims over the Western Sahara, you know, are going to very much complicate life for the new administration in part because they fly against the wind of previous initiatives, uh, UN Security Council uh, resolutions, and what might be argued to be just international law, <laughs> plain and simple. So I think that the administration is going to find itself, you know, among many things that it wants to unwind from the previous previous government said of how to address this at the same time recognizing that U.S. relations with Morocco and of course the North African states, Tunisia and so on are very important to our strategic and political interests and we don't want to start uh, taking, making moves that uh, would in any way uh, sort of undermine the, this, these, these interests and these relationships. Uh, right now the priority of the United States is not on North Africa in, in any significant way for better or for worse. I, I would like to see more attention on Tunisia, many other folks who, who follow Tunisia recognize that the fate of its democracy will be influenced in part by the readiness of the international community to step up and support it. But this is not a fundamental priority now of the United States. It's very much the Gulf, the, uh, the Syria, Iraq region, Iran, and so on. Okay, I have another question from Muhammad Shaib about the Biden administration strategy to go back to the Iranian nuclear deal. The, this is a two-tier question. One tier will go to Ahmad and the second to Daniel. The first tier of the question, is the American 
view of uh, returning to the Iranian nuclear deal linked so much to other issues like Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. And what will be the Iranian reaction to such linkage, Daniel? Will Iran accept such linking between these issues and returning back to the nuclear deal, Imad? Is it is it me or or Daniel? <laughs> Imad, you you answer us about the linkage between other issues. I don't think that the Biden administration really wants to link the situation in Syria and Lebanon to any nuclear negotiations with Iran. If they manage, i.e. the United States under the Biden administration, to restore or to, re to make sure Iran will return back to the nuclear deal as it was in July 2015, this would mean a huge success. I don't think Iran will will be ready or concerned with the returning or linking that with any other issue. I think the Biden administration will try to deal with Iran exclusively regarding the nuclear deal and according to its own interests. Of course, the question of Israel will always be there. As for Lebanon, Syria, or Iraq, I don't think the United States would care much about their position. Daniel, Tehran's view about this such mean the link. Right. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I I think that for Iran, it's absolutely essential that there be no linkage here uh, between these negotiations. I do think in a wider sense, as some one has to recognize that the, the Biden administration is coming into a region in which um, its its ability to play its hand and its leverage has been has been greatly weakened by by several things, including the fact that once the former administration walked away from the agreement with Iran, it upped its uh, uranium enrichment uh, very quickly in, in the last in fact in the last few weeks, and that has upped its its uh, its uh, its leverage. Um, and so, one of the paradoxes of the Trump administration policy is it's really to some extent weakened the uh, American hand because the Iranians now have push forward so much more quickly and have that card to play. And also beyond that, the fact of the matter is that when it comes to other regional issues, including, of course, first and foremost, Syria, you know, Iran, Assad, and, and, and Putin and Moscow are sitting in the driver's seat. I'm not celebrating this point at all, but given the disaster that has happened in Syria. But is the United, what is the United States going to do and what is its position in terms of using whatever leverage it has to change the situation. And I would suggest we have very little leverage. Uh, and so that is, you know, that is a reality that works in favor of Iran and its allies. And finally, just end on this note, and that is, of course, from the perspective of Israel, and to some extent, key Gulf, Gulf states like the Saudi, Saudi Arabia and UAE, their position is that, in fact, the United States has a lot more leverage because we have the sanctions to, to use. Um, and therefore, their position is that the United States should just hold on to the sanctions as long as possible and use the sanctions as leverage to force the Iranians or compel the Iranians to uh, link the negotiations over the nuclear issue with regional issues. And I, while I certainly understand that position, I don't think it's going to work. And I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, have uh, very much uh, effect on either the position of Iran, for sure, or the United States. But it is well worth keeping in mind that the Israelis mean business when they, when they, when they argue that they believe that, you, that the Biden administration is playing its cards very poorly. And that is going to frame how Israel approaches the, these negotiations in the coming weeks, assuming they go forward. Uh, Sama, let me conclude with you. We have a couple more minutes. I'd like to uh, address a couple of issues quickly regarding uh, uh, Yemen. Uh, I think you mentioned in your remarks that the issue of reconstruction in Yemen has not received any serious attention <laughs> thus far. Should the U.S. link the Lender King mission, which you described as difficult, uh, to uh, reconstruction, and, and should the new administration you know, put, put its billfold 
uh, where its mouth is and trying to resolve the issue there. I mean, do they fully understand uh, in Washington the magnitude of the needs uh, to bring uh, Yemen back from uh, the uh, destruction that has been sustained over the past several years uh, since the beginning of the war? I think uh, without a doubt, the U.S. understands the magnitude of human suffering that's happening in Yemen. Otherwise, they would not use that as the tool and the key to end uh, conflict in Yemen. Otherwise, you know, if it wasn't for the humanitarian crisis and the utter devastation that's that's happening there, I don't think they would have had this motivation to end the conflict, <clears> besides <throat> the fact that it is, in fact, solving the Yemen conflict is key to solving the Saudi-Iranian tensions. When it comes to reconstruction, I want to point out that Trump's administration suspended uh, aid to Yemen. And uh, I think that's super problematic. And I suspect that as early as March 1st, we're gonna see uh, the US return to the idea of, of releasing aid uh, back to Yemen and of supporting um, the, the ending of the humanitarian crisis there. I think that anything that US envoy to Yemen, Mr. Tim Linderkin comes up with is gonna have to be supported and backed uh, by United Nations Security Council resolutions and decrees. And one of the things that is happening now is the discussion of adjusting or perhaps removing uh, the, um, the stipulation of the resolution 2216, uh, United Security Council resolution 2216. Um, I think that without a doubt, the US understands that Yemen is gonna be a money pit in terms of rebuilding, especially because the local forces on the ground continue to fight each other. And especially because the Riyadh agreement uh, can't seem to even hold. So imagine even larger uh, political agreement I think the US is definitely gonna try to put that bill on Saudi Arabia. And this isn't new, by the way, putting the Yemeni bill on Saudi Arabia has been something that the US, previous US administrations have done ever since al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula uh, became present in Yemen. It, there was always this perspective that the US cannot continue to fund a lot of the things that are happening there and that someone else has to take care of the Yemen file, which is also why I think the Trump administration um, attached the Yemen file to Saudi Arabia because they think of things in a financial perspective. Um, so that kind of is where I think things will go. Uh, shukran, uh, Sama El Hamdani. Uh, shukran, Daniel Bromberg. Uh, Al Hamdani. Thank you, Daniel Bromberg. Thank you, Imad Harp, for your contributions, valuable contributions. I would like to thank all our participants. Uh, in this uh, webinar, especially our colleagues at the Arab Center, uh, especially Dr. Marwan Qabalan for all the logistical preparations. I thank you all, all of you, and uh, God bless, and until we meet uh, soon, take care and goodbye. Yeah, Khalid.